over there, so feel free. We're fortunate today to have uh, Don Kramer, and he has put together the beginnings, he tells me. It's not a finished product, but he has put together the beginnings of the history of the plumber building. And I think he, like Sherry and all of you that do research, the more research you do, the more you find you need to learn, and the more involved you get in it. And so I'm sensing that uh, we may have trapped Don. And, uh, you know, as this progresses, we'll have him out again. I want to touch base on just a couple of things that are coming up, just because otherwise after you're done, you all take off on me and I don't get a chance to talk. So uh, Bob Breen, who uh, wrote the book Once Upon a Town, the one from Rochester Reads, is going to be out here a week from today, the 18th at noon for a lunch. Now it's a $20 cost, and what you do is we feed you, uh, Bob is going to talk, he will uh, sign books if you bought the books. It's kind of a mini fundraiser for the History Center. But he will be out here noon next Wednesday. Uh, when you leave on the table, there is a, a flyer for the Smithsonian Institution Barn Again exhibit. And it also tells about a bus tour that Cheryl is putting together around the county to visit 24, 25 barns. Uh, I gather there's a round barn and there's some other distinctive barns. We'll have a stopple barn open. The Mayo family is going to open up the Mayo Wood Barn uh, down, you know, that you drive by all the time and don't get a chance to get into very often. But there's some others. We also have uh, the new issue of the Olmsted Historian. And sitting in the back corner there are uh, Steve and Jane. And they are the ones that have volunteered their time for the last two years to actually design and put this all together. And it has really... It has come a ways, as you probably are aware, and this is our biggest issue. It's a 12-page, and so they're sitting on uh, the, the uh, table. If you're not a member, if you're a member, you should have gotten it mailed to you. If you didn't, talk to Barb because we screwed up somewhere. Uh, but if you aren't, uh, feel free to pick one up, and maybe we can uh, convince you you ought to be a member. And then we also have at the desk two books for sale. One is Houses on the Hill, and that's Ken Elson's book about the Crawford homes. And so we have that book for sale there. And uh, Ken has given us all of the proceeds to the History Center. So uh, it's just a straight uh, fundraiser, if you will, for the History Center. And uh, next month, Harley, as you're probably aware, finished, finally got his book published. All right. We have copies of the book. And he is very excited, as only Harley can be excited. <laughs> but he will be here next month for the Princess Cafe. So the second Wednesday of March, now I can't remember what the date of that is, but he will be here, and he will, of course, be uh, talking about his book and being Harley and signing it. So, And we have these for sale at the, at the desk. So uh, if you're interested, Barb's got them there. So that being said, yes. Can I make a quick plug? Yeah. On March 14th, as part of the Sussman Centennial, uh, at the auditorium, they're going to be, there's going to be a session called It Takes Faith, and it's going to celebrate the contribution of organized religion to Rochester over its 150 years history. There will be displays by a lot of the town churches. I think there are up to about 50 churches now, historical displays for each of the churches. And then there will be some kind of an ecumenical service. So I'll be putting this up on the bulletin board. Uh, by all means, check www.rochester150.com. That'll tell you all about the different events, and I think a lot of them have made it to the newsletter, too, and I appreciate that. So maybe we should just drop some of those flyers up there. Yeah, if you want to give it to me, I'll, right there. I'll uh, run some and, and put them on the table also. Yeah. Our reservation is required for lunch next Tuesday. It would be helpful. It's next Wednesday. It would be helpful just so we know how much food to get. So if you would like to come, please give Barb a call. Uh, I think we have approximately 40 coming right now. We can put in here, we're going to remove that wall. We can probably put in somewhere around 60 or so. Rochester has this nasty habit of all deciding that they're going to come next Wednesday morning. So uh, give us a break and make sure we've got enough food for you and enough table sets. So if you'd like to come, give us a call. And now 
I am going to quit talking and give you uh, Don Kramer, and he's going to entertain you with the history of the Palmer Building. So, Don, the floor is yours. Thank you. I apologize if I have my back to you too much. Let me know, and I'll try and turn around and make sure. Can everybody hear okay? If I if I just talk like this, I'll... I'll... No? <laughs> I'll try and make sure I turn around and let you know. Okay. Uh, much of it, uh, of the interest will be, of course, the pictures. We've got uh, well over 100 pictures of the building. Um, but uh, I, today, uh, I, I just want to share with you kind of the history of that building. It's been an intriguing uh, uh, project for me. Um, uh, as, as John said, uh, my name is Don Kramer. I'm an electrical engineer uh, by training. And uh, uh, the first portion of my professional career, I worked for Ellerby Architects, who is the uh, designing firm for this building and, and many uh, clinic buildings. Uh, and, and it was during that early uh, part of my career that I did a lot of work in Rochester with Mayo and became intrigued with uh, Mayo and the buildings and, and of course the history and, and of course this bu beautiful building especially. Um, uh, in 1986, I joined Mayo on their facility staff, and, and I'm uh, uh, now a senior project manager and also part of the management team for the facilities uh, area at the clinic. Uh, today, uh, uh, today, we'll just cover uh, uh, the uh, kind of the, the origin and the history of the building, kind of how it was constructed. But as many, th uh, uh, as many of you observe, it's, it's gorgeous architectural structure. And so I want to kind of point out some of the architectural uh, attributes and, and the artistry of the building through, uh, through the photos and, and some of this, the original sketches uh, for the design of the building also. Uh, also, uh, some of the details that, that you may not get close to being able to see. And so we've tried to photograph those and, and bring those out to you. And then I'll conclude a little bit with uh, what uh, Mayo is doing to preserve uh, this beautiful uh, structure. So with that, I apologize, I'll occasionally refer to my notes. <laughs> I've got a lot of notes here because it's got a lot of the interesting stories about it. Uh, the Plummer Building, uh, or some of us even call it the 1928 building, was uh, uh, for many years known just as Mayo Clinic Building until 1954. And that's when it was officially uh, named uh, after Dr. Plummer, who is the uh, 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 instrument, uh, uh, instrumental uh, physician in the creation of the building. Um, and so, but to, but to really know about the history of this building, uh, we've got to go back a few years before that, to 1920 time frame. Uh, 1920 was six years after the completion of the uh, first Mayo Clinic building, the 14 building as we often call it. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, after the uh, six years of occupying that building, space was already a premium. And this is, those of us that work in facilities recognize that this is a, a perpetual problem. <laughs> we, uh, uh, the clinic has a propensity to continue to grow, and we never quite build them big enough, I guess. Um, anyway, the space was at a premium, and so they began uh, to expand out of this building into the nearby Zumbro Hotel. And at that time, uh, to, to make it convenient for the staff and the physicians, they built a bridge to connect from the uh, Zumbro Hotel to the uh, uh, 14 building, thus the first skyer <coughs> in the city of Rochester. Uh, uh, also at that time, uh, because of the growth of the clinic, it was uh, necessary to begin to uh, migrate back to some of the previous buildings that they occupied. Uh, so the, uh, the practice that was closely integrated in the uh, 1914 building uh, started to dilute and as they uh, uh, expanded into other areas. It was in 1925 that the crowding of the, uh, uh, this 1914 building was so significant that the decision was made uh, to uh, invest a major new structure. Uh, prior to planning the new building, however, they needed to address, uh, there were about 15 different uh, plants that provided heating uh, for the buildings and, and generated electricity for some of the uh, buildings in the downtown area that served both the Mayo Clinic and the Kaler Hotel. So at the suggestion of engineers that uh, work for uh, Tom Ellerby, uh, the Kaler, uh, the Kaler's uh, Jack uh, Kaler and uh, uh, Mayo, in particular Dr. Plummer, 
uh, decided to collaborate on the creation of uh, a central heating and power generation plant. And that, of course, as you know, is the Franklin Station, and this is a picture of the uh, original structure. Uh, that building is named after Benjamin Franklin, and the street that it's on was originally called Franklin Street, and, and thus uh, uh, the uh, origin of that name. Uh, distribution of the utilities uh, from that plant to the Plummer Building and to the Kaler uh, Hotels was a, uh, a major concern, so as they plan that, and they were going to tear up the streets anyway, they decided to bury the uh, utilities in a tunnel. And the tunnel idea took uh, uh, such uh, positive, uh, received such positive reaction, they decided to expand the tunnel. And actually right now today there's two uh, tunnels. One on the lower level is, is the utility tunnel, and on the upper portion is a pedestrian tunnel. And that was the first tunnel that was installed for purposes of, of a patient and staff to move between uh, buildings. That was the first public tunnel anyway. Um, the Franklin Station uh, began its construction in 1926 and was dedicated in 1927. Uh, the original facility had coal-fired boilers uh, in the downtown, and the original building cost $250,000 uh, to build. Mm -hmm. At the urging of Dr. Plummer, uh, the uh, natural gas was finally brought to the city, and in fact, the, the Franklin Station was the first building in the state of Minnesota to receive natural gas, and that was in 1932. The relationship uh, between uh, the, uh, the the firm of, of Ellerby and and, and uh, uh, Mayo really began a little bit earlier uh, when uh, the founder uh, Franklin Ellerby did a number of projects uh, in the city. He did he did the uh, the 1914 building and the Taylor's uh, Zumbra Hotel, uh, but then in 1921 he passed away after surgery here in Rochester. Uh, and uh, his son, uh, Tom Ellerby, took over the firm. Tom Ellerby had already begun to uh, build a relationship in the community. Tom had done the design of, of uh, Henry Plummer's home and uh, had done a number of other prominent residences and churches in the community. The, the firm of Ellerby began planning uh, the Plummer building out of their uh, St. Paul office but eventually opened an office, and a couple of us were talking early, remembering that when Ellerby actually had an office here in town. And the majority of the design was then completed in, in the Rochester office. Serious planning began uh, for the Plummer Building in 1924. At that time, registrations uh, at the clinic, and, and you can hardly read the bottom line, but in 1924, registrations were 60,000 annual uh, patient uh, uh, registrations. Uh, today that's well over 450,000 uh, by comparison. However, some of the clinic staff, as, as uh, uh, those of you know how Mayo works, uh, were not all convinced that we still needed a new building. So there was a, a fair bit of debate uh, going on within the organization as to the need for the structure. And in uh, February, uh, of that, uh, of 1926, the press uh, reported that the, uh, uh, the building was uh, beginning planning and it would be a 1.5 <coughs> to $2 million uh, building standing about seven to eight stories high. Mm -hmm. um, the size of the building was going to be determined by the amount of money that the clinic felt that they could afford uh, for building a structure. Um, and the location of the building was going to be the courtyard uh, the sunken uh, garden that was immediately south of the 1914 building. Uh, this is a picture of Rochester in 1927 and, and of course was uh, a booming community. Um, uh, in 1927 uh, the press reported a new significantly enlarged structure costing two and a half to three million dollars and now was going to be 13 stories tall and early photos of the clay model uh, uh, show that the, uh, uh, some of the features of the building, but also show that the building was supposed to have an entrance on the south facade facing 2nd Street. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, that decision was the first change and they realized 
Uh, there was more merit to have a common entry with the uh, 1914 building. Excavation began in 1926 uh, for the building. Uh, for five months, the area was excavated and prepared to receive uh, 2,800 tons of structural steel and uh, 260 tons of reinforcing uh, steel. By comparison, the recently completed uh, Gonda building used uh, 14,000 tons, so uh, more than five times uh, that amount of steel in this structure. During the, uh, uh, the steel uh, assembly, uh, people uh, uh, heard very little uh, noise from the construction because the building was built with bolted connections instead of riveted. Uh, riveted uh, connections were the standard of the day, but they didn't want to uh, add more uh, noise to the downtown area. Uh, steel riggers uh, 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 came from St. Paul and were headed by uh, a gentleman named Ernie uh, uh, Seabloom, uh, who's a Scandinavian. He took great pride in his uh, vocation uh, and what he had learned from building structures such as the uh, cathedral in St. Paul. Uh, increasingly, the uh, steel riggers on the project were, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the steel riggers were paid about a dollar an hour because of the risky work working on this building. Uh, the riggers noted uh, uh, special problems with working on the building through the winter time, trying to keep warm because of the, uh, the winds and the cold uh, weather in Minnesota. After the skeleton uh, was, was raised, the girders were encased with concrete and, uh, and the floors were poured with uh, reinforced uh, steel. Uh, the outer walls of the building were covered with a layer of Bedford limestone from Indiana, and the, the base of the uh, structure is Cold Springs brand, uh, granite from, uh, uh, from Minnesota. Uh, Gar Schwartz and Company was the contractor, the general contractor, and he was responsible for coordinating the construction of um, uh, all of the subcontractors uh, including plumbing, heating, uh, electrical ventilation, and decorating. The upper walls of the building were constructed. Oops, I'm going to go back. Were constructed with uh, two million seven hundred fourteen thousand bricks, including seven hundred thousand face bricks, or the, uh, the exterior of the building, which came from Pennsylvania. Uh, those seven hundred thousand face bricks were manufactured uh, using the finest ore clay which is mined uh, similar to coal in Pennsylvania. The majority of the bricks uh, were, were obtained through Chaska Brick Company out of Chaska, Minnesota. Uh, 14,000 of the bricks were specially constructed to uh, create the ornamental uh, corners of the building uh, that are laid uh, in such a way to represent a, a spiral twist of rope. Between 1924 and 1927, Dr. Plummer and the architects collaborated on uh, designing a myriad of details uh, that would produce uh, not only a functional but an aesthetic uh, building with a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, details. There are two important considerations that they uh, placed uh, uh, on the building design and that was to first analyze and learn from the experiences of building the 1914 building and secondly to increase the uh, uh, emphasis on the aesthetics of the structure. Um, I'll go through a series of, of, of pictures that show so these are some of the original sketches made by the uh, Ellerbe uh, architect staff uh, for the uh, creation of the uh, building and then some of the features that it really turned into. And if you look at some of these, sometimes you can find a date and they date they do date anywhere from 1924, some of the earliest sketches, uh, to uh, uh, the 26. So it was interesting, they were trying to create some of these details while they were uh, still building the, the, uh, uh, the original structure. And there's some of the uh, carving details that are used in one of the doors. And that's a door where that uh, occurs, and that's up on the 14th floor of the uh, building. Uh, some of the handrail sketches. And, of course, there's the, the, the detail of what the final product is. Just, just even the, uh, the artistry of the drawings themselves were, were amazing. 
Dr. Uh, Dr. Plummer chaired the building committee, uh, and, and as I mentioned, was very instrumental in, in, in designing and creating this building. He worked with uh, Dr. Uh, Wilson at the time and Harry Harwick. Uh, Ray Corwin uh, of Ellerby was uh, primarily responsible for a lot of these uh, designs and the sketches, uh, both on the interior and the exterior of the building. Um, early, uh, early in the planning, uh, Tom Ellerby proposed that such a decorative scheme uh, be incorporated uh, into the finishes because he thought it would benefit and provide relaxation to the patients uh, while they were waiting at the uh, clinic. And of course, Dr. Plummer was enthusiastic and, and really encouraged uh, the idea of adding richness of detail to the entire building uh, design. Uh, the cornerstone of the building uh, had been laid in June uh, 22nd, 1927. And it was late in 1927, while on a trip to Europe, that Dr. Will sent back word that he had discovered magnificent Carillon bells. And he startled the architects by saying that he ordered a set of those to be manufactured for the building, which of course wasn't designed to have that. So the architect, Dr. Uh, Ray Corman, uh, began promptly designing a graceful open belfry uh, over the uh, central <coughs> elevator tower. Fortunately, uh, the, uh, the building structure had been conservatively designed and no major structural modifications had to be made uh, to extend the building an additional 55 feet tall. Uh, the original uh, uh, carillon uh, was 23 bells and was uh, purchased from uh, Galay and Johnston uh, of Croydon Bell Foundry in Croydon, England. The, uh, before they were um, uh, shipped, they were totally assembled as, as shown here in the uh, foundry. The largest of the bells uh, weighs uh, 7,840 pounds. Uh, total weight of the carillon was uh, uh, almost 37,000 pounds. Uh, the, the, the bells of the carillon have a range of two octaves. That was the, the first portion of the bell. In 1977 is when they added uh, uh, 33 uh, more bells, and they ranged in size from 20 pounds to 130 pounds. And that uh, created a 56 uh, bell uh, carillon that exists today with a range of four and a half octaves. Uh, the later bells were uh, made in, in Holland in the uh, uh, Pettit and, and Fritzen uh, bell foundry. On Sunday, September uh, 16th, uh, 1928, uh, the Mayo brothers uh, dressed in military uniform uh, uh, opened an hour-long ceremony uh, that uh, uh, was held to dedicate the nearly complete building and a carillon uh, uh, in particular uh, dedicating it to the World War I heroes. The uh, uh, second uh, avenue in front of the building was blocked off and as you can see a large flag was used as a backdrop for the ceremony. Uh, the Rochester Municipal Band and the uh, community chorus and, and uh, American Legion Drum Corps were all part of the uh, ceremonies. Uh, at the program's conclusion, the largest bell um, was rung 65 times in honor of uh, Dr. William Morrow Mayo. Uh, this largest uh, bell, number 23, is inscribed, and it's kind of hard to read, but it says, dedicated to the American soldiers. Uh, and it's signed by Dr. Uh, Will and Charles Mayo. Um, it was at this ceremony that Dr. Uh, Charlie uh, uh, told the crowd that because of the great need for space for the clinic, that they would not have a formal uh, opening ceremony uh, and that the uh, building would be opened as rapidly as they complete the floors. Now, doesn't that just sound like what we did in the Gondi building? It's amazing how history repeats itself. Uh, thus, the building was declared open. Um, it was, uh, uh, with the completion of this building, uh, it now, it, with the uh, bell tower on it, uh, it was about 16 stories tall, 295 feet above uh, the street level, and for a brief time, this was the largest clinic in the world, and the tallest building in the state of Minnesota. What was the next building that was uh, finished about a year later? Foshe um, Tower. Foshe Tower. Exactly, the Foshe Tower in Minneapolis. 
At the top of the Caroline is installed a beacon for airplanes, or that was there, uh, and that was moved from the Ear of Corn uh, water tower. And, uh, and it resided on top of that building for a number of years. It became a landmark uh, for, for air travel, which was just beginning in Rochester at that time. Years later, the beacon was removed and is now located in the harbor of Mid Lake City. In the 40s and 50s, uh, the tower and the south face of the Plummer Building were decorated uh, at Christmas time. You can see the shape of the Christmas tree. Um, some of the architectural uh, and engineering attributes of this building. Uh, note that the building itself did not have an entry. Uh, the entrance to the building is common, constructed in the annex between the uh, 1914 building and the Plummer Building. Um, above all, however, the building uh, was to be functional. And Dr. Plummer designed it around typical exam rooms and, um, uh, and, and he mocked up those exam rooms, which is something we also do a lot today, uh, constructing them and then having them evaluated by every staff member using the input uh, from those staff. And, and with the original building, they erected 500 exam rooms in the original uh, facility. Uh, each of the floors had two reception desks with a central lobby and seating area. This is a floor plan uh, <coughs> sketch of the building and as you can see, the clinical corridors on either uh, wing with the uh, central elevators and the, and the uh, central lobby and reception desk uh, lobby. A uh, picture of some of the early uh, waiting areas and, uh, and desks. And this is on the seventh floor. And one of the things that we have uh, been successful in doing in this building is retain that ceiling. It is in integrated with uh, uh, the waiting area and a conference room that's used by our legal department, but, but you can still see the original artistry of that uh, ceiling area. Uh, let me see, get back to on track here. A few of the other features of the uh, building are the exam room. And, and one of the things you'll note is the similarity uh, uh, of the design uh, of the exam rooms. What they developed back in the 1920s for an exam room model is that basically the same model is used for the exam rooms today. Uh, so you see the physician's desk in the corner opposite the, uh, the hand washing sink. And in fact, it was part of the design of this is when they uh, created the uh, uh, means for hands-free washing. Uh, there is a knee valve you can see underneath the sink uh, to operate the, uh, the water. And that was part of the creativity of the uh, design and construction team for the building. Uh, excuse me, on that other slide, did you comment on the uh, ventilation system that, with the two grills? Uh, I'll touch on that a little bit later, too. Uh, but, uh, but the ventilation basically was served up through there. And concealed behind those grills is uh, 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 the heating system uh, using uh, radiators. They concealed it in the wall. And the air flew, uh, flow across those coils helped uh, heat the building. You also see the exam table and some of the instruments. Of course, they're a little earlier vintage. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the dressing cubicle behind the door. Again, these are standard uh, details that we uh, employ in our exam room design still today. Um, transportation was another hallmark of the building design. Uh, there were five high-speed, at the time, <laughs> elevators installed in the building. At that time, they were believed to be one of the, uh, uh, the most state-of-the-art installations of elevator equipment uh, in the country. And uh, a total of $125,000 was spent on the uh, installation of those original elevators. Uh, the entry to the elevators was, uh, uh, was constructed of bronze, and uh, the bronze doors uh, were highly ornamental. Uh, the cabs were ventilated, which was uh, unique in its time, and the side walls were padded with leather. leather. It was said that Dr. Plummer went to uh, the downtown of uh, major cities and, and just to observe the flow and movement of people and see where best to place 
elevators in the building uh, as part of the, the design uh, planning. Uh, the engineering uh, genius of, of Dr. Plummer uh, not only reflected in, in the uh, creation of the um, uh, single <coughs> medical record uh, for patients, but also in the transportation system to get those records to each of the floors. Uh, you can see here is some of those transportation systems. This is part of the original conveyor system. Uh, this would be the uh, control desk where the histories were kept on the uh, uh, first floor of the building. Uh, and, and then behind that is the pneumatic uh, tube system. Um, uh, working with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, George Grasby of Lamson, uh, Dr. Plummer uh, devised a scheme to lift uh, with vertical lift uh, to bring the histories up through the building and included with the system was a device to kick the histories out on the respective floor that, the, that they had to be uh, delivered to. Uh, Mr. Grasby also recommended the utilization of pneumatic tube, and it was at that time that the tube system was constructed uh, from the Plummer Building to St. Mary's Hospital, uh, encased in a, uh, a waterproof conduit and uh, uh, operated with uh, uh, compressed air. Uh, the uh, tube is a one mile distance from, from uh, downtown to St. Mary's. Also uh, of high priority was communications. And it's one of the first buildings in, uh, to incorporate a sophisticated telephone system that could uh, dial up and call each of the rooms. Uh, also, if you walk through the clinic building, you noticed uh, outside the exam rooms, the colored lights. Uh, that was designed and created initially as part of this building also. Uh, that uh, colored light uh, code system was uh, there to uh, identify to the desk which rooms were vacant and which rooms uh, the doctors needed to be uh, called to. Also part of that original design was the, uh, the design of the exam table, uh, as I mentioned, which, which is essentially the same uh, model that we use today uh, with some slight refurbishment to it. The building heating and ventilation was at the time considered state of the art and, and as we talked about the, uh, uh, the heating coils were concealed in the wall behind there. Uh, the the uh, mechanical ventilation scheme provided uh, clean air with proper temperature and humidity and uh, uh, air was either exhausted or recirculated. Uh, the, uh, the comprehensive control system that they put in at the time was able to regulate the room temperature to within one degree, uh, which was very uh, uh, amazing in that era. Uh, the building heating was provided by a high and low pressure steam, which came, of course, from the Franklin Station. Uh, and the cooling uh, was accomplished in those days by cold water uh, uh, using an air wash system that would flow cold water across the, uh, uh, the ventilation uh, system. Uh, now let's take a look at some of the more spectacular spaces in the building. Uh, this is a sketch of, uh, original sketch of, of the assembly uh, hall, or plumber hall as it was originally uh, named. Uh, it has a parquet floor uh, uh, and, uh, and the, the uh, wood finishes are uh, intended to resemble an English library uh, using imported English oak for the creation of that. And of course the ceiling uh, had the beautiful ornamental uh, plaster uh, cast ceiling. Uh, the original facility was equipped with state-of-the-art projection, motion projection equipment uh, in it. Uh, the room uh, w was uh, also uh, uh, fit out with a, a very large fireplace which at one point was used. And this is a picture of the, uh, uh, the space today. Uh, so you can see we've uh, tried to retain uh, the beauty of, of that space. Excuse me, sir, what floor is that on? This is on the 14th floor. On the 14th floor. Okay. So if you, uh, if you go up uh, into the Plumber Building someday, just go all the way up, and you can see this space. It is open. Some of the other spaces that were created as part of the design are the original boardroom and some of the board members at, in that era. Uh, and then uh, also on the 14th floor was the, uh, the design of the entire entry uh, to that uh, assembly hall, 
which was also a gorgeous space. Uh, and, and that's what the space is uh, still today with the uh, decorative uh, wood ceiling to complement the, the uh, English oak that was used in the adjacent assembly hall. One of the other uh, interesting spaces is the library, which is in the 12th floor of the building. And uh, when that was constructed, uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I'd like to have you note uh, somewhat the austere uh, finishes of the original building and a, a later slide how they upgraded the, uh, uh, the finish of the space. But with the construction of that, they put in a wood ceiling with the beams uh, uh, engraved to uh, list the names of, of famous individuals in science and medicine. And then you can see if, a few years later the uh, uh, installation of carpet uh, into the space. And also noticed above the uh, archway going into the, uh, uh, the, the book area uh, was uh, when they uh, added, this was in about the mid-30s is when they uh, added the carpet and uh, did some of the painting above the archway. <coughs> What's that represent? Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of uh, times there's just a lot of symbology that didn't have any specific objective. But I think uh, just knowledge uh, is the, uh, uh, the lantern. Uh, the most effective uh, uh, expressions of the artistry of the building are found in the uh, beautiful bronze doors uh, that are at the entry. Uh, the, of these, uh, most prominent and best known uh, are, are the, of course, the, how they operate and how they're shared with the 1914 building. These doors weigh 4,000 pounds and are of a Moorish design. They're five and a half inches uh, thick and uh, uh, 16 feet uh, high. The original doors cost $12,000 to fabricate. Uh, they were fabricated by Flower City Ornamental, which is a company that still exists in St. Paul today. Uh, and the design of the doors uh, uh, follows a Romanesque design. And Flower City employed a sculptor, Carlos uh, Brioschi, who created the, uh, uh, the uh, model designs for the doors. Both sides of the doors depict Minnesota life in alternating squares. There are six um, uh, panel designs that are repeated to make 22 panels. And then there are two uh, of the uh, uh, designs that are repeated uh, 20 times for a total of 42. Uh, the, the symbology of these is, is interesting in that they, they uh, represent the themes of education, domestic arts or maternity, uh, mechanical arts, fine arts, sciences, and agriculture. So they were trying to really depict this era and, and the uh, 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 area in which uh, uh, the, the clinic practice. And here's some closer detail of those. Uh, this one would be identifying the mechanical arts and of course uh, uh, maternity or domestic arts and agriculture. And then we have the, uh, the two uh, repeated designs, which are uh, more of a floral design with a center medallion, one with a turkey and the other with the American Indian. The doors were originally designed to close, and of course, we, as we know, that that doesn't happen, but they were originally designed to close every day. Uh, and they were uh, fed up with an electrically operated uh, motor to, uh, to close them, and they could be operated from either inside or outside of the building. However, shortly after the installation, the electric uh, uh, motor uh, drive uh, failed, and uh, because of the significant weight, uh, they no longer uh, close the doors. Uh, the doors are now used and, and closed only uh, as part of a ceremonial uh, recognition for the passing of presidents or prominent individuals. Yes? Pastor, you said 4,000 pounds. Is that each or each? Yeah. Each was 4,000 pounds. So they're two pounds. tons each. Yeah. Huge. Could it be opened manually very easily? The, uh, they, they are opened and closed manually. Not very easily, but they are opened and closed <laughs> manually. <laughs> they were closed uh, uh, first in, in 1936 with the uh, death of Dr. Henry Plummer. And then in 1939, for the death of both uh, Dr. Uh, Charles uh, Mayo and Dr. William uh, Mayo, uh, 
1963 for the death of uh, Dr. Donald Balfour and also the death of President uh, John F. Kennedy in 63. Uh, again, they were closed in 1968 for Dr. Uh, Charles W. Mayo and in 1978 for the death of Harry Harwick, who was, of course, the administrator uh, for many years at Mayo. Uh, the most recent closing of the doors was uh, September 14, 2001, uh, when they were closed as part of a memorial cer ceremony held at Mayo uh, uh, for, uh, in memory of those who died uh, on September 11th uh, at the attack of the World Trade Center in the Pentagon. Um, the uh, horizontal members above the doors uh, uh, called rails and the vertical uh, members called styles are highly ornamental and have inserts of microscopes, scales, human figures, pelicans, gophers, rabbits, squirrels, and beehives. So again, very much trying to uh, relate to uh, this part of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the U.S. The glazed uh, uh, inner doors, as you can see here, are liberally sprinkled with uh, griffins and dragons, and uh, human uh, figures, all symbolic of vigilance, is what they were trying to do. The uh, uh, stone spiral and basket weave and columns and the, and, and the moldings uh, uh, that form uh, the, the door, and, uh, and, and also there's a lunette uh, uh, divine that was uh, sculpted above the door, as you can see here. The lunette contains two groups. Uh, the one uh, on the left, represents uh, medical science, and the, uh, the grouping on the right um, represents medical care. I know they're a little difficult to see, but if you go out there someday, uh, just, just stand close and, and look at the beauty of the creation of those. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, design was created by a St. Paul sculptor also uh, named Kirshner. Uh, the keystone <coughs> above the, uh, the door is a, uh, a carved bust, a figure of truth, symbolized uh, by the two torches held aloft. Um, on the facade uh, uh, above the, uh, the doors are, are, are a variety of other sculptures, including a couple uh, a stone medallion representing the arts of uh, nursing care. All of these uh, uh, designs were created uh, all of these uh, designs were created out of the uh, uh, LRB uh, office. Would something like that be carved or molded? Uh, that would be carved out of stone. This was all carved out of stone. Uh, the Romanesque style of, of, of the Plummer building is, is clear in the columns and arches above the door, but uh, also in particular is the uh, uh, kind of the liberal sp sprinkling of uh, theological and uh, allegorical uh, or symbolic uh, themes throughout the, uh, uh, the uh, building. And these were all uh, carved out of uh, the Bedford limestone. Um, uh, they, they reflect uh, some of Dr. Plummer's uh, love for art, literature, music, horticulture, uh, and focus on a variety of objects uh, related to America uh, and Minnesota, and, and Rochester in particular. Uh, on the Second Street side, uh, let's go off to some of the other sketches. On the second street, uh, or west side of the building facing the Mayo building, are carved a, 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 a bird, an eagle, a rabbit, a buffalo, uh, a squirrel, uh, a, a fish, a Viking's uh, ship. Let's see if I can get a couple of those. The Viking ship. Uh, and St. George uh, uh, slaying a dragon. Uh, St. George is a patron saint of England, which is the birthplace of uh, Dr. William Morrow. Uh, also, uh, some of the carvings included um, uh, a pelican in a nest, uh, a trimotor uh, airplane, which was the first that landed in, in Rochester, and, uh, and a cartoon of uh, Dr. Uh, Henry Plummer examining the plans of the building. Uh, on the building's south side, there's also a number of different uh, 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 carvings, and, and, and I wish I could have added all of these because there's so many, but uh, there's a partridge, uh, geese, um, of course geese, uh, uh, appropriate uh, symbology of Rochester, but gophers, uh, parrots, 
and I'm not sure what the parent connection is, uh, a swan, the insignia of, of Minnesota, uh, the skull of an oxen and a ram, the United States insignia, and a wildcat. Uh, but of, uh, of, of special interest is a, uh, oops, is a, uh, a, a carvings <laughs> that uh, uh, depicted Dr. Plummer's humor, uh, reflecting the outcome of the 1928 uh, uh, presidential campaign. Dr. Plummer was a staunch uh, Republican supporter, and his, yet his close friend, uh, John uh, Raskob, was the National Democratic campaign manager. And during the design of the uh, building and, and its construction, the uh, men would uh, enjoy friendly exchanges uh, concerning the merits of each other's candidate. In November uh, 1928, Hoover won the presidential uh, race over Smith, and Dr. Plummer approved the carving that depicts the National Party symbols posed symbolically representing the election's outcome. <laughs> so one of the features, of course, is the triumphant Republican elephant uh, with his head raised high, and the other depicts the dejected Democratic donkey with his ears drooping the tail between his legs. Uh, the tower and upper portion of the building contains several uh, kinds of decorative figures and uh, terracotta cladding. The, the, uh, uh, the top of this, is, uh, the top, most of these are a pair of nurses at each of the corners of the tower. Uh, immediately below these are a series of gargoyles uh, on the various sides of the building and also owls uh, symbolizing wisdom, uh, winged salamanders, uh, uh, depicting uh, uh, rejuvenation and a hawk representing uh, vigilance. Uh, below these were, were a variety of other gargoyles and uh, vigilant griffins, all symbolizing uh, medieval times and, and uh, vigilance uh, and, and medical uh, uh, attributes. Um, there's a, 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 a huge number of these uh, surrounding the upper portion of the building. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate that uh, uh, we can only see these sometimes with uh, photography. Um, uh, within the building, uh, an extensive array of beautiful bronze work was generously scattered throughout the, uh, the public areas. Uh, and this was represented in some of the door poles, the, uh, the stair rails, uh, uh, door lintels, uh, and, uh, uh, and even the uh, directories. Uh, carved stone uh, was used uh, for the uh, drinking fountains, uh, and, uh, and that was created by uh, uh, an artist, uh, uh, Jean Bonnet, uh, from France, and that was in each of the elevator lobbies. There's also carved uh, um, um, symbols in the, uh, in the columns and the door lintels of all of the entries. Uh, the intricate plaster of the uh, of the building is also amazing and was created uh, designed by Ellerby along with a plaster sculptor uh, Ryoshi uh, Minetti uh, company of, of St. Paul. Uh, uh, included with these are a variety of cornice and, and beam uh, designs uh, with ornamental uh, features uh, um, that, that just can uh, be just enjoyed if you just stare at some of these for a while. Some of the beauty of, of the creation of those. And, and again, some of the very simplistic uh, floral, but uh, you also see the ear of corn and the owl. And those patterns. Again, just beautiful design. Um, in the, uh, throughout the building, on the uh, upper floors, uh, the, uh, the flooring is a terrazzo, and terrazzo is a mix of, of uh, marble chips and cement. Uh, Twenty-two carloads of marble were shipped to Rochester uh, and installed by uh, Venice Art and Marble Company of Minneapolis, uh, and, and that uh, forms the majority of the public space. However, on the public main floor, which is photographed here, is what's called an art marble, which is a scientific mixture of marble chips and colored cement. Each piece of this art marble uh, in this floor was individually cut and fit um, before it was shipped to Rochester for installation. There's several, seven uh, different colors used here. 
There's a red marble which uh, originates from Algeria, a rose from Italy, tan is also from Italy. The light green in this is, is from uh, Pennsylvania, with the dark green is again from Italy. Uh, the yellow is from Algeria, and the black is from Belgium. So again, very international in the origin of uh, many of these uh, features. Uh, the counter at the main entry uh, is made of uh, Italian black uh, and gold marble. Uh, carved and inlaid with uh, marble uh, uh, mosaic of various colors. Uh, the walls of the lobby uh, are uh, 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 marble, uh, Notre Dame marble uh, from France. Now let me just tell you a little bit about uh, preservation uh, activities over the last several years. As you can imagine, a building that's 75 years old, uh, there's a lot of uh, challenges in keeping it up and, and retaining it. During the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, uh, there was an extensive amount of research laboratory installed in the, uh, in the building. And uh, those types of facilities place a heavy burden on a building. Um, in the past 10 years, there's been a, a significant effort to relocate those uh, 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 types of spaces to more appropriate buildings. Uh, in, in 2003, we just completed renovation of several of those former uh, laboratory floors, and they've been converted back to administrative space that's now used by uh, legal department and research administration, among others. Many aspects of the building infrastructure have also been renovated over the years, uh, including the uh, mechanical uh, and plumbing systems, uh, electrical and communications are constantly being upgraded. But an example uh, of some of the upgrades that were done is about three years ago a project was undertaken to upgrade the elevators uh, and uh, uh, while the, uh, uh, the building controls were replaced with electronic and, and new mechanical machinery, the, the historic finishes of the elevators were retained in the original cabs and the elevator lobby. Uh, all of that was restored, uh, cleaned, and retained. Over a million dollars was expended just on the elevators alone to upgrade those. Uh, then in, in, in 2000, a, a multi-year project was undertaken to replace 618 windows in the plumber building. And with that, we also renovated uh, the 55 uh, lead glass uh, or stained glass uh, windows. All of the windows were selected to match the original uh, design of the building, uh, but with uh, a metal cladding to, to uh, uh, minimize maintenance. This allowed us to finally remove um, some storm windows which had been installed for many years over those original uh, windows. Uh, and also uh, allowed us to remove some of the UV protection that had been applied over the stained glass. So it improves the visibility. So I hope you take the chance to take a look at the building and even go up in there and, and see some of it. Uh, uh, we spent about a million and a half dollars just replacing and uh, repairing windows of, in that building. Um, although uh, periodic uh, design uh, repair was done to the exterior of the building, a study in, in 2001 uh, identified a significant failure of some of the brick, and in particular some of the, uh, uh, the brick roping of the building. As a result, we had to apply some temporary uh, uh, closures on that building uh, to uh, protect it so it didn't uh, uh, totally fail. Uh, so we are now in the midst of a uh, four-year uh, project to uh, renovate and, and replace the uh, uh, repair the exterior of the building. And that will include a replacement of, of uh, 327, uh, oops, uh, 327 or about 5% of the terracotta pieces uh, that have uh, broken uh, uh, on the building. Uh, those are being specially molded uh, and, uh, and they're created by Boston Valley Terracotta, uh, one of only two companies that does terracotta work in the U.S. anymore. Do you know why they failed? Uh, moisture. 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 Not steadily. No, no, no movement of the building. The building structure is, is very solid. But uh, over time, 
Uh, terracotta is, of course, a glazed uh, tile uh, product, man-made product. And if moisture gets into the product, uh, it will start to crack. Also, we had a few cases with, uh, uh, with some of the pieces uh, missing. Uh, or, or um, uh, as, as in the case of uh, a tool on the uh, uh, perimeter uh, parapet. Uh, by uh, 2005, we will have spent uh, about $3 million, which is the cost of the original building, just to fix the exterior of the building. Oops. Excuse me, has anybody ever estimated what it would cost to build that building today from scratch? I don't think we've gone at all. <laughs> no, seriously, well, I don't know if anybody has. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think we could do it. I, just, I, I recall, I showed uh, someone who runs a huge international construction company in the building uh, about one year ago. They had a tour through the whole building and he was looking at a building. It's probably about how magnificent. And he said, you know, we could never build this today. And I said, oh, you could, I bet you could build this. And he said, no, I could not. I could build a, a very grand building, but I could never do this. Because there are not the, um, it's like you said, there are only two firms that do this. Mm -hmm. He said, there aren't the people who do this kind of building. And um, it would be very hard to get over the article. The, 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 that's part of the, the uniqueness of the building, the artistry that went into it. And, and much of it was local, although uh, in those days, many of those uh, local workers were immigrants uh, from, from Italy or other countries. But the artistry of just creating some of the plaster moldings, we've saved a lot of moldings. And we've had to create, for even for this uh, uh, terracotta that we're replacing, we're creating new molds uh, to be able to rebuild uh, those. And of course, we'll save those molds, but to try and to uh, recreate uh, some of those it's just a very unique art. And, and so I guess uh, really this concludes the, the, the formal part of the presentation. And I guess I just want to thank you for sharing uh, uh, with me this, uh, this beautiful building. And, and it's our hopes and expectations uh, in Mayo that, that we'll have this building for at least another 75 years, if not more. So, yeah. about it being hemmed in. We've already lost pretty much the view from the west because of the new Gonda building. The, let's see, there's another one, the Carlton building to the north. There's the Kaler Hotel on the east side. You, as you're coming into town, you can only see it clearly. But especially when you go back and you look at yeah. photos like this. Yeah, and I know. Back it's, in, it's, in it's, the it's, 30s it's, when, when it was the only building in, 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 in the area. Are, are there any considerations for keeping at least one view of the building? I mean, there's always construction with Mayo Clinic, and I can see it being framed in by all these... Not Actually, in, in my opinion, I think we, we just recently accomplished it, and I wish you'd uh, go in the Gonda building. Uh, as part of the design of that building, we tried to bring in exterior light into the patient waiting area, and, and that uh, created a, a very unique footprint, but also made a transition from the Mayo building to the Gonda building of a wave uh, glass wall. Uh, if you go up into that casual area just outside of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the elevators, uh, you go up in the Gonda building, you have one of the best views of this building. And in fact, uh, one of the occupant groups that I worked with on the, uh, uh, on the Gonda building is the uh, cancer treatment unit. And they're up on the 10th floor and they face the direction of, of the plumber building. A, a gorgeous, gorgeous view of this building. It, it actually added back in. And you're right, you know, with the tall structures from the highway, you can't see the building as well. But uh, from within the city, I think we've added back in the opportunity to see the uniqueness. The design of the Siebens building, if you notice, was stepped back purposely to, to uh, retain view of that, uh, of that north face uh, of the building. Uh, and, and of course, it's interesting, even our medical staff has said, until the Mayo building uh, was uh, raised to its last uh, uh, extension up to the 19th floor, were they able to finally see out the windows of the, the beauty of that building? And so the downside is, yes, that building obstructed the view. But the plus side is somebody now get, get close enough to look out the window and see it. 
Yes. Do we have any documentation uh, from Plummer or the uh, Mayos as to why they thought it was necessary to build such an ornate building in a relatively conservative environment in the Midwest? That sort of thing? It, it really goes back to their desire after creating the 14 building, which is a uh, which was a well-planned, very functional building, and it actually helped create the best flow for, uh, for bringing patients and, and doctors' movement. But what they really felt they, they missed uh, was uh, the, the artistry and, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the decor that would make uh, patients uh, feel comfortable. And so really the emphasis was on uh, upgrading the aesthetics of the building. And that's why, and, and maybe they, maybe they, in their day, went a little too far. But, but think of the number of years we've had to enjoy it now. But they, uh, they really did uh, emphasize uh, to try and make this a statement uh, uh, and something for the patients to appreciate. Don't, don't you think also they travel to Europe so frequently, probably once a year, if not more often, they could. They saw those buildings in Europe, and uh, and they wanted to somehow to bring a piece of that home to where they serve and to the people that they serve. They thought they deserved that kind of, of artistry. And truly it did. They did incorporate a lot of things from Europe. As I mentioned, some of the uh, uh, materials uh, came from uh, Europe that were... Including yeah, all the marble. Including a lot of the marbles. And yet, and yet the like emphasis that. to tie in and find a balance to tie into the local uh, uh, area with, with some of the carvings that they put into the building. Yeah, I'm sure.